Yeah, so it's, it's a pleasure to introduce Sean for this seminar. Sean uh, came originally from the States, from Massachusetts, where he grew up in a fishing family. He came to UBC and uh, did a master's degree with Scott Hinch and a bunch of us on salmon, and then uh, did his doctoral degree with me on uh, rainbow trout fisheries in the BC interior and the way trout behavior limits uh, vulnerability to fishing. I have to tell one anecdote about Sean while he was doing his PhD work, he was doing a lot of fish tagging and so on. I got to watch him. He was doing it by his recreational fishing. Sean is the best fly caster I have ever seen. And I've seen a lot of fly fishermen. Nobody can cast a fly as far as Sean can. He was just an, it's just an absolutely amazing sport fisherman. He, uh, he went to, did a postdoc at the University of Wisconsin working on uh, ecosystem modeling of the Great Lakes and the Central North Pacific ecosystem, you know, for a little variety. And then uh, went to SFU where he's been ever since. And he's worked on an incredible range of stock assessment issues and harvest management things. So you couldn't ask for anyone in the world with a, be a better person to talk about the challenges in uh, getting our kind of uh, quantitative research actually implemented in the field. Sean, most welcome. Well, thanks, Carl. I appreciate that. Uh, it's too bad we haven't got back out to do some fishing together. <laughs> We should get like a joint SFU UBC uh, fishing retreat when all Absolutely. this is over. <laughs> Non-competitive, but you know, and just enjoy enjoy each other's company. We'll be looking forward to that. So yeah, thank you, and and I appreciate the chance to to talk to you today. And um, my my interest in harvest strategy research. So so Carl did a pretty good job of. Uh, accurately describing where how I got here um, the one event that he probably doesn't know about is um, back when I was a grad student at UBC when I was doing my master's and um, it was it was the end of of classes in the spring and and I had been waiting for the for the Hillborn and Walters book to come back to the UBC bookstore and and so I would go in every day and check if it was there and they told me it was coming. And so finally it arrived and I bought it on a Friday and I sat down in my apartment by myself because my wife wasn't with me at the time. And I sat and at ate macaroni and cheese and hot dogs and read that entire book from start to finish. I, I was done by Sunday night. And as, as I don't know if you've ever read that book, but the, the deeper you get into that book, the more and more clear it becomes what the what the issues are and how to solve them in fisheries. And at the end of the book, it was all about harvest strategies and and how that's really uh, the approach that we need to take. And and so that that was the light that switched for me, and um, it's it's been that way ever since. So that kind of I've kind of put tried to put myself in positions where um, I can I can use it and and use that my background and kind of further develop my background in that area. Let's see. Here we go. Okay, so an overview of this talk, um, I'm gonna briefly describe uh, what's, what's the precautionary approach to fisheries, which tends to be the main overriding motivation for modern uh, harvest strategy research. And the increasing demand for, as you probably know, management strategy evaluation, which is the current, you know, what it's what's currently called, um, to develop precautionary harvest strategies for application in the real world. Um, in in Canada, there are not a lot of examples where MSC has been actually used and and produced management procedures that are consistently applied in practice. And so there's a few. You know, I've I've tried to think about kind of what are what are the main issues that I've seen in my uh, experience that kind of lead to this this problem, and so the biggest one is the what's called the best assessment perspective, and so I'll talk about that. Um, the length of time it takes to develop harvest strategies and get them implemented, 
so they tend to take a long time. And then right from the beginning, quite often it's unclear what the expected benefits are going to be. So just a, a little picture here of some of the fisheries that I've been involved with uh, harvest strategy research, either as an author uh, developer, which are the ones that are underlined there um, to varying degrees, um, or a, a panel member on a, on a uh, scientific review panel, which, which tends to be the larger uh, the commissions, the Pacific Halibut Commission and um, the Southern Bluefin Tuna. Hey, Sean, I just wanted to mention you got a crayon box covering up some of your slides there. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I've never had that happen before, or nobody's ever mentioned it to me. It's part of part of teaching online where it's just you're talking into your computer and, and silence. I appreciate that. Uh, picking that up, thanks. So uh, the precautionary approach to fisheries, um, basically the, the idea is to maintain uh, or focus on maintaining natural capital in terms of fish stocks over short-term yield. Um, increasingly, there's, there's less emphasis on trying to maximize bi biological yield as the primary objective of fisheries management. In, in most of the fisheries that I've been working on, there are at least two higher priority um, objectives related to stock conservation that take precedence over maximizing biological yield. Um, so right, right from the precautionary approach, just a, a couple of quick definitions here. Uh, the precautionary approach exercise, uh, exercises prudent foresight to avoid unacceptable or undesirable situations. And so we can imagine how these could arise in fisheries because you know, we deal in fisheries with situations that are highly uncertain. That we have limited and uncertain data and uh, dynamics that are not that well understood. So precautionary approach makes a lot of sense for fisheries. And the core element of the precautionary approach is what's known as a management procedure. And this is uh, a description of the data and how it's analyzed and how that translates into action. So this is an example for uh, the BC Pacific herring management procedure that's, that's in place for our five herring stocks. And basically there's, there's some data that's collected each year of various sorts. And then that, that information is processed in a statistical catch at age model, um, you know, fancy fully Bayesian state space model. It estimates the biomass harvest rates, recruitment, um, natural mortality in this case. Um, and then that information gets passed to a harvest control rule, which uh, on the right, there is the, is the one that's actually used that translates some stock status assessment into a target harvest rate and uh, a quota. Um, this particular procedure that's in place for, BC, for at least for Strait of Georgia was developed back in the 1980s by uh, Max Stalker and Carl and I think Vivian Haste and maybe a couple of others. And, and that, that procedure, which they basically used an MSE approach uh, is still in use today. It has worked pretty well for the Strait of Georgia, uh, not necessarily so in, in the other areas for, for various reasons. So the, the current practice though in, in, um, in stock assessment, at least since the 1990s, and, and this kind of when I was a graduate student is when things were really ramping up and as, as a result largely to the Hillborn and Walters book and a couple of others, uh, increasingly focuses on fitting highly parameterized models uh, to data and judging performance based on statistical fit. I think, I mean, as I mentioned, the, the later part of the Hillborn and Walters book is where the really interesting uh, meat and potatoes are, but it seems like people stopped uh, before they got there and, and really ended up focusing more on statistical fitting. And so in Canada, for example, uh, like herring, the, there's some data that's collected, models are fit, and then uh, decision tables or, or some kind of information is passed to managers and they choose a quota. And so that process is repeated, you know, for some like herring, it's every year, for some stocks, every five years, for some, especially um, 
you know, in, in Canada, some stocks haven't been assessed for 10 or 20 years. Um, one of the issues with this is there's a short cycle time from the data to the decision, and that doesn't leave a lot of information, uh, a lot of time, sorry, to reflect on decision quality. And decision quality being, you know, whether this process is likely to meet long-term objectives and whether it's robust to uh, uncertainties. So a couple of issues with this kind of statistical approach to model fitting. First, um, the stock assessment models we tend to use today fit the data quite well. And that tends to give a false impression that stock dynamics are somehow predictable. Uh, models are good at describing what happened like this one, uh, just a simple um, state space model fit to Northern resident killer whale data. But if you look at a projection, uh, they blow up fairly quickly. Um, so they're not very good at predicting what could happen. Here's one for uh, West Coast of Vancouver Island herring, um, where basically the model has the ability to estimate recruitment and natural mortality. And both of these vary quite a bit over time in the past. And uh, neither one is very predictable going forward in the future, especially natural mortality. Uh, we really don't have a lot of handle on what drives uh, current patterns in, in natural mortality. And of course, they have a huge effect on uh, harvest strategy outcomes in the, in the future. The second problem is that assessment models might be unbiased on average. This is, you know, when, when people do simulation testing work on stock assessment models, they tend to focus on uh, the bias and variance of the estimator itself. And that's fine. Uh, you might find a, you know, a model that's unbiased on average, but you don't know when you go out and use it, uh, whether it's biased and by how much. And um, Similar to the, to the first problem, when, a lot of, when you have multiple models, like, like in this case, we have two models for uh, Strait of Georgia herring, uh, you can have two models that agree pretty well on what happened in the past, but then they diverge um, on the current state as well as the response to harvest strategies going forward. And finally, at least in my opinion, looking for the best statistical model doesn't seem very scientific or precautionary because number one, the, that science is based on multiple working hypotheses and disproof. So rather than searching for the best, uh, it's more about kind of eliminating implausible alternatives. And going for a best assessment ignores possibilities that could lead to harm and that's not necessarily precautionary. So the, the idea in current harvest strategy research and management strategy evaluation is to not accept the management procedure that hasn't been demonstrated to be effective in, avo in avoiding undesirable outcomes. Um, and in, in that case, it, it, they need to be evaluated in terms of their st uh, statistical uncertainty as the things I just talked about, as well as to incomplete understanding of what is driving dynamics, like recruitment, natural mortality, and so on. So just, um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure how much people get into uh, these, this type of research, but just, just to be clear on what I'm talking about, a perspective evaluation basically is, a, is how we evaluate management procedures and simulation models. And so the a simulation structure, basic one is like this, where you, on the left, you have an operating model that models the true dynamics of the stock and the fishery. You sample that model there in the middle um, with some sampling error, and that generates data, which is then used in the management procedure on the right. And that management procedure recommends some form of regulation. In this case, it's a catch limit um, for for example, a, a, the prawn fishery that we're working on now, it would be a fishery opening uh, or, or closure. Salmon fisheries could be opening openings or closures as well. And then that response is, is fed back into the operating model. So this, is, this kind of system would somewhat realistically propagate 
various errors and uncertainties that occur in the system. And so th this type of simulation approach is um, you can model uh, various realistic scenarios to test reliability of procedures and revise as necessary until something uh, appears acceptable. So the, one of the criticisms that people quite often, I would say mostly comes from, from the fishing industry is that you can't represent real fisheries, real fish stock dynamics in the computer. We don't understand them well enough. Um, and the best response to that that I've ever heard is that if it doesn't work in the computer, well, it's probably not gonna work in real life either. And so that, that's kind of a main motivating feature in you know, con continuing to work with simulation models and kind of get around those, those initial barriers. So this, this approach, this kind of management strategy evaluation simulation approach, um, it changes the focus from that short-term single best assessment um, focus to a broader harvest strategy focus, look, looking at the entire um, harvest strategy itself. And if you think about it, the idea really, it, it's a, to me, it's a more scientific approach because uh, for a couple of reasons, it, you entertain multiple working hypotheses. Um, your decisions are repeatable because we're using formal management procedures, repeatable management procedures. And the decisions are almost guaranteed to be high quality because you've, you've taken your decision process and evaluated it in the context of uncertainties. And that's usually the main definition uh, behind decision quality. And it also incorporates a, a lot of the other things that we've developed over the years, you know, things like adaptive management and um, collaborative engagement with science stakeholders, First Nations management, and so on. And, and the focus is really on the management problem rather than the statistical problem. So some of the challenges in taking this approach into the real world that, that I'm, you know, um, I would say in my limited experience, I mean, there are certainly people, you know, like Andre Punt, for example, Doug Butterworth, who have done a, way more than this than me, but in reading a lot of their papers, um, I, these are the three main challenges that I see are not mentioned in those papers. So that's, that's why I brought these up and the reason for my talk. So the, the first challenge is one of perspective. And usually MSEs tend to begin from a best assessment perspective by focusing on the operating model. Um, almost invariably when in, someone proposes, hey, let's do an MSE. Okay, what's the operating model going to be? Uh, that's often the first question. Um, and the, the problem with that is that there are N possible operating models and here N is the number of scientists involved in the, in the problem. And so if, this is one, for example, uh, when we started working on Sablefish, it was me and Rob Cronland. And we had, you know, two, four operating models that we worked with. Um, a couple of years ago, I got involved in Atlantic bluefin tuna. We probably have 15 to 20 scientists involved. And they started out you know, easily with 15 to 20 operating models. Um, Southern bluefin tuna has 413. <laughs> so that, that is not the place to start in MSE. Uh, most of the ones that, you know, you can't really say, okay, all successful ones have done this or that, but the, the higher chance of success comes from starting with a decision context, a clear, decision context where the problem is defined and some objectives are set, number one. And then the decision context itself is getting at, you know, what is going to be decided, who's going to decide it. The, the, this is actually, it's never clear. I, I've never seen a situation where it's clear to begin with because it's a difficult problem. 
um, I, I put a reference down there to um, to Gregory's book, Structured Decision Making, where there's a there's a good section on this uh, particular topic, and I think it's very relevant to management strategy evaluation. So a couple of examples that I've been involved in uh, for BC Sablefish, for example, uh, when when we began that it was it was the mandate was to establish a transparent decision rule. That was that was the main objective, and it was clear that at the time uh, DFO and industry were in a co-management arrangement, and we knew that the actual decision makers, the people who were going to decide on whether to adopt a management procedure were right there in front of us in the room. And so we could directly, you know, educate them on the process and, and get through it. Um, Atlantic Calibet that I worked on several years ago is, is one of those kind of secret MSEs that where it kind of got done so quickly. Um, some people didn't think it was an MSE, but I, I know it was. Um, in that case, it was uh, it was very clear mandate to develop a, a precautionary harvest control rule, and and again, DFO and industry were the decision makers, and they were all at the table, so it got done fairly quickly. Um, with southern bluefin tuna, um, if, if I'm not sure if you know that story, but I'll get into it in a little bit. But in that case, the stock back in 2002 was at five percent of its unfished size, and it was about to be listed by CITES. And so it was very clear they needed a rebuilding management procedure. And then the who was going to decide was interesting because initially the idea was that the member countries would you know, get together and choose a procedure, but it wasn't happening um, for various reasons, that, you know, different challenges that, I, that I'm talking about until at one point the commissioners uh, said, well, if you don't decide, if the member countries don't decide, then I'll let the science panel, or we, we will have the science panel determine the, the quota. And that kind of shook everybody up and clarified the actual decision context and things got solved. So I shouldn't, I shouldn't you know, it's not all, um, it hasn't been all success stories. One example is uh, of a failed MSE that I've been involved with is the the fishery on Skon Kinglis Bowie Seamount off the uh, coast, north coast of Haida Gwaii. And there, there was a, there was a seamount stable fish fishery, a very small one uh, going on. And um, the, the fishery had been identified through the Marine Stewardship Council as potentially causing impacts, uh, unacceptable impacts on corals and sponges because the, the fishery uses large traps that sit on the bottom. And so, uh, you know, we, what was interesting here is that the, the industry came to me and asked, well, could we use our MSE process to solve this? You know, could we develop some kind of management procedure that we could demonstrate low risk while still getting our economic fishing opportunity? And so naturally I was like, well, let's, yeah, it's a really good situation. And so we, we started out, we did some, some workshops with, um, with the Council of the Haida Nation, with DFO. Um, we, we went out and designed and developed drop cameras. We built species distribution models. Uh, you know, we used protected areas were going to be uh, the actual regulation that we were looking at. And we had various operating models for coral dynamics and the fishing effort distribution. And this is, this is one, I, I think I gave a, a talk on the early part of this um, at, at UBC when we started this, uh, I think it was like 2014 or something. Um, this, this project has continued to evolve. In fact, we just published a, a paper last week on, on this particular model. Um, but with the camera data, we were able to uh, I think we had a few hundred um, drop camera observations of corals and sponges across the seamount in collaboration with the fishery. So we were able to develop these detailed species distribution models. We had very detailed historical fishing effort data. Uh, we had everything we needed here to, to do something like this, which is a basic, um, you know, kind of what you would do for a fish stock 
where you, you look over time at the status of the stock and develop population dynamics models and things. And basically this, this result showed that um, over, this, over the entire seamount, uh, the coral was probably in a very healthy state. Uh, there was definitely some impacts in the past, but those were diminishing quite a bit because the recent, recent fishing efforts quite a bit lower than it was in the past. And then, um, and then we, uh, in a minute, I'll show you a slide where we even propose some further closures that, that made uh, recovery, this, this thing recover quite a bit. But from this, this is the, the, the area on average. And then we're able to even do this on uh, a really fine scale grid here of, um, I think these are 100 by 100 meter resolution maps here where we could assess the likely status of, of corals in these little boxes. Um, so scientifically, this has been a really interesting project and we even you know, worked on simulations of, of collecting new data, of putting in proposed uh, closures. You could see you know, there are a couple of hot spots here where um, you know, those little red, red spots there in the lower left corner of the seam out there that tend to get hit pretty hard. Um, those are pretty good coral habitat and putting closures in and around that would actually protect what, what the good stuff that's there. Um, but this, this, never, this never went anywhere. Uh, we basically got to this stage and, and the fishery was shut down. Um, and it was shut down basically um, due to perceived risk to sensitive habitats. And it was based on just a handful of high coral observations. And the whole MSC and risk assessment was essentially ignored. Um, in hindsight, looking, looking back at it, this is a very clear situation where the decision context was not established from the beginning. We, we thought we were, you know, we thought we were working on objectives and things like that, but it was, it really was never clear how the management board was going to make a decision and, and whether to um, adopt this, this new approach. And so the lesson I got from that is there, there are some situations, particularly involving governance that MSC is not meant to solve. So it would be good to know going in to an MSC process by exploring the decision context, what the governance issues are and whether they're likely to be a, um, be a problem. The, the unfortunate thing about this particular situation is that, um, and I guess this is a risk of MSC maybe, but we went through this whole MSC process, <clears throat> generated a lot of information, and then it was basically used to close the fishery. And that is not something that the industry uh, didn't notice. And so what's happening now is that, that this, this very situation is being used to basically disincentivize this kind of research and possible bottom contact management procedures on the entire coast, because the industry is basically now fearful that information is not going to be used um, in a in a scientific way. So that's that's a risk, right? That's a risk of of you know digging in and, and exposing some some things. And this isn't new. Uh, this is definitely something I've been aware of since I've been involved in fisheries. Is you know sometimes people don't want to don't want to look at the skeletons in the closet. Couldn't resist. I knew Murdoch was going to be showing off his fishing pictures, so I couldn't resist a little reference here to uh, to recreational fishing. So, but it, it is relevant to challenge two, which is that MSE takes too long, and it, it can take too long. And so, the lesson from recreational fishing is when you when you're fighting a big fish, you get it done quickly. Uh, you, you, there's less chance of things going wrong. Um, of losing it, and especially it's more humane. <laughs> and this, this is both applies to fish and to fishermen and managers and everyone else who is involved in MSC. Uh, make it humane and get it done quickly. Um, it, it, kind of sitting back and thinking about it, I, I think you know one to three years 
is plenty of time to develop preliminary management, develop and test preliminary management procedures. Uh, for one thing, you can't get involved in too many operating models. You can't let them get out of control unless you have a very efficient way of doing it and good agreement on what those are. Um, you know, like I, like I mentioned, when, when we started working on uh, Sablefish, we had a couple of operating models that we thought were the most important. Um, we had two axes of uncertainty and we used two levels each. So we had four. Um, and it, it focuses the, you know, it, it keeps the focus on the decision-making uh, task rather than turning it into a long-term research and tinkering project. Um, if, you, if you look at the, the, the structured decision-making book I mentioned earlier, that makes a contrast between a decision culture and a research culture. And it's very easy for MSE to really gravitate towards the research cu culture. Uh, more operating models, you know, test this, test that, try this, try that, you know, go spatial. There's lots of ways that they can get out of hand. And if, but if you're focused on the decision that needs to be made, a lot of those, um, those it's not that those issues aren't important and they shouldn't be done, is that they shouldn't necessarily be done first. And I'll, I'll give you an, an example uh, later on of what I mean by that. Within three to five years, I think most, three to five years is a reasonable time for an MSE to, to adopt a formal management procedure. Um, and again, it, it probably, you know, it probably depends on resources that are put to it and the complexity, some, to some degree, the complexity, but the complexity is somewhat manageable as well, at least the scientific complexity. But if you, if, you know, if you get into situations like Atlantic bluefin tuna that has you know, several countries involved, halibut that's got a couple of countries, but a really diverse uh, stakeholder group, Pacific hake, again, multiple countries, diverse stakeholders, those, those tend to get bigger and more complicated and they tend to drag on. Um, and I think if you go beyond five years, then you, you can start to see some, some burnout. And I think we have seen that in, in some of our longer, longer term ones. In our sablefish example, this is it on the right here. And in that case, we, we proposed an MSE in 2000. It was actually 2005 was the initial proposal, but uh, formally in 2006, we proposed the first um, management procedure in 2008. And we, there's a reference I have in a minute here coming up that we published a paper on that showing, um, you know, contrasting a few procedures. And then that procedure was not actually adopted for another three years. So between 2008 and 2011, we were kind of quasi following what the management procedure was saying, but the industry was still doing the old, you know, uh, kind of massaging the, the quota recommendations to kind of ease the pain that was needed at the time, which was to reduce the quota quite a bit. And not, it wasn't until 2011 when uh, the, the management procedure was formally adopted. Things have actually turned out pretty well for Sablefish mainly because we got a good recruitment. So in terms of things taking a long time, they, there's a couple of exceptions. Uh, one is the southern bluefin tuna, and in that case, uh, their first management procedure was called the Bali procedure, and it was developed over a period of about seven years. And during that time, uh, the stock had rebuilt um, from five percent when they when they started. Uh, the procedure was adopted in 2012, and the stock is currently sitting at about 20 percent of unfished. So it's just being engaged in the process is actually, and this is the same thing we found for Sablefish. Once the process was formally underway, people started to see a better way to make decisions and things started happening right away. Um, now, there's, there's a couple of things about that. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, for tuna, the stock was about to be listed by CITES in 2002, so there was urgency. And I think if you read the you know, adaptive management, especially, uh, Carl's adaptive management book and, and other places. Um, 
you never want to let a crisis go by. You know, you want to take advantage of a crisis situation when it's happening. And that's this kind of urgency uh, issue. And then the decision context was made very clear by the commissioners when, when the process was kind of going along and going along and dragging on. The commissioners at one point said uh, that the participating countries needed to choose and adopt a management procedure or the commissioners would have the science panel do it for them, which is a scary thing if you're, you know, to let a bunch of scientists and uh, at the time, I think it was, I'm not sure exactly who was on the panel, but I you know John Pope and Anna Parma, Ginny and Ellie, um, Anna and Jen and I are the current panel, but you know, Having three scientists make a, a TAC decision uh, was definitely a, a good incentive for, for people to, to move forward. And so since then, the Bali procedure has, has been quite successful and now it's fairly straightforward to turn over the MSE process. Similarly for sablefish, uh, as I, it, the previous graph was showing, the, the stock was in its worst condition as of 2005 and six, the stock was, um, it looked like pretty dire straits at the time. So it was fairly urgent and the decision context was clear. Um, even then, uh, in, in 2011, we had what was called the, the finger wagging incident where uh, we had done all the work. We had a management procedure we thought was the best and there was a vote in, the, in one of the advisory committees to adopt it and it was, it was passed. And then the industry asked for a socioeconomic considerations, which, which is their way of saying, can we have a few extra hundred tons of quota? Um, and the manager at the time, Tammy Mawani, who, um, you know, tiny, you know, uh, young woman, she basically raised her finger and started wagging it at, at the director at the time and basically said, you know, you just spent five years working on this procedure and how many hundreds of thousands of dollars and you're not gonna use it. And that was the last time anyone ever proposed socioeconomic considerations and basically the, the procedure has been followed to the letter since then. Um, for, for BC Herring, uh, this is one that's been ongoing since 2015, um, but, and, and there was already a fairly well-established uh, decision-making procedure there for Herring um, for the most part, uh, but this was also right around the time when uh, a lot of protests were happening and every year uh, there was a court injunction on several of the fisheries so we, we basically revised most of the management procedures within a period of three years. Um, but of course, some of them remain closed because uh, for a couple of reasons. One is elevated natural mortality and, and low productivity. So the stocks just aren't viable for fishing. But then even if they are, we have a governance issue as well. So again, that's that the decision context uh, not being resolved and that's, um, that tends to be a fairly strong barrier to, um, to moving forward. Um, but uh, we still continue to use the MSC process mainly because this approach is, is far better for First Nations engagement, especially compared to the best assessment approach. Uh, there's, there's so many ways for First Nations to be involved in this process compared to you know, a desktop um, you know, best assessment that is basically turning the crank on an assessment model. So we've, we've actually um, had some good success there and especially working with um, uh, First Nations in Haida Gwaii and west coast of Vancouver Island. Um, way back when I was working on uh, sablefish, I, I don't know if I discovered it, I read about it somewhere, but you know, I think everybody knows the 80-20 the rule, the 90-10 rule, this is where you know 80% of the of the output comes from 20% of the effort, and this is I think this applies for sure with with MSE, and I think it's something to keep in mind 
And basically where 80% of MSE insight is generated by the first 20% of the effort. As long as that first 20% of the effort isn't, isn't on generating 18 different operating model configurations. Um, for Sablefish, for example, uh, this table on the upper right was what we published in 2000. We, we did the modeling and we were done by 2007, came out in 2008. Um, where we were pointing towards a target harvest rate of 6% on legal sable fish. And at the time in Alaska, they were using 10%. And before we started this MSC process, uh, BC was targeting 9%. And this 6% this looked a little crazy, but that's what the, you, know, you needed to do. And so 2019, um, just a couple of years ago, uh, the models have become way more sophisticated, uh, the operating models, because uh, we've continued to work on them. Uh, we have a whole, now we're trying to manage uh, juvenile bycatch. You know, we're trying uh, fairly sophisticated management procedures here, but still, um, you know, things are coming out. Uh, target harvest rates between five and a half and 7% a year, depending on, uh, the level of juvenile juvenile impact. So really we got most of the work done uh, right away and the rest has been kind of evolving and looking at new questions, um, you know, rather than continuing to try to get it perfect from the beginning, so. And uh, finally, um, quite often it's unclear what the benefit of MSE is going to be and so most fisheries management agencies claim to be precautionary, right? They can uh, claim to use them because they collect data, they do assessments, they assess trade-offs and so on, but it's not clear what the benefit of MSE is going to be. So one of the things that I would advise people to do is number one, uh, establish what the status quo procedure is and then demonstrate through MSE whether that is likely to be the best option. So this is, an example, when, when Steve Martell and I first reviewed the Sablefish uh, Science and Management Program, um, we, were, we were trying to, you know, one of the questions was, is it precautionary? And we thought, well, well, let's see. So, so we just plotted the, uh, the estimates of the biomass versus the historical TACs and, and this kind of relationship came out and of course we forced a curve through it. Um, but it, it looks, you know, roughly repeatable to some degree. So this became the status quo decision-making procedure. And this was the one we were gonna see whether we could do any better. And so <laughs> right away, the 80-20 the rule kicks in and we simulated this and it, this has been the worst decision rule that we've ever looked at for Sablefish. Uh, we really don't, we don't consider any, we don't have any procedures now that ever crash the stock uh, except this one. This one created quite a bit of failures and actually never even made it into, um, into the, the first paper we wrote on this. Um, so, and it was a real eye opener, you know, because industry looked at that and said, look, we have a harvest control rule. DFO looked at it. Look, we have a harvest control rule, but, you know, throw it in a simulation and, and certainly showed it's, it wasn't that great. Um, the last example I'm gonna give is, is Pacific Hake. And this is one again, transboundary stock. Uh, in this case, the biomass is, is hugely uncertain as you can see in that top plot there with the, those Bayesian credibility intervals are pretty wide. And of course there's highly variable uh, recruitment is, is the main driver here. And so when we, were, when we started, I was working with the, the tailors Ian Taylor, Nathan Taylor, who you know, hopefully help some of you know, um, and Alan Hicks. Again, uh, we, we were about to test, okay, that uh, I think the original question was, okay, well, the status quo is the 40-10 rule. Um, and so I remembered back to Steve and I's work on Sablefish and I thought, well, let's see if they actually are implementing the 40-10 rule. And of course, when we plotted the, the TAC output from the assessment and then the actual TAC um, on the vertical axis there, they did not fall on that diagonal line or anywhere near it. Uh, in fact, it was, it was quite a bit different. Um, so the question was, okay, if we, if we represent that, those 
you know, fit a model to those points instead of going with the 4010, which they clearly are, are not using, um, would that be better than following the treaty? And so the long story short, when we, when we did those simulations, it was, it was became very clear. And this, again, this, you know, we started this work in 2014. It was published by 2016. So in a very short period of time, we showed that this realized rule had, it was one of those win-win situations, right? It had better long-term catch by, no, by 9%, higher average stock biomass, which would also translate possibly into CPUE, of 15%. And the variation from year to year to year in catch was 35% lower. So clearly a better alternative to the US uh, kind of 40-10 type of rule. Um, the reason for this is, you know, going back to those problems with stock assessment is that, you know, this model is quite uncertain. And when it comes up with really high stock assessment estimates of biomass, those errors can be proportional to that biomass. So you can have huge uh, overfishing consequences when this model has, has errors in it. But, but basically what happens here is when you, the rule here caps the TAC at about 350,000 tons or 375, I forget. Um, but essentially caps it at 375,000 tons, which is about what the fishery can take anyway. And that basically eliminates a lot of those um, over overestimation errors and the problems associated with them. But uh, so we, we, we showed this and um, instead of adopting this rule, the, the commission, the, the joint management committee sent the MSA team to do a spatially explicit model about four years ago. Um, and that still isn't done. Um, so Again, and I, and I can almost guarantee you they're going to come up with something like this is going to be what they would find anyway, um, regardless of, uh, of the spatial effects. So to wrap it up, um, so there's increasing demand for an MSC approach. I think this is definitely true. And I, and I, it's, you know, I run into more and more of my students in these MSC processes, which I think is great. Um, getting them off the desk and into practice, there's, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. Um, and there's, you know, there's no guarantee they're actually going to be adopted, even if they look good. And so the three things that I've mentioned, number one, adopting a, a strategic perspective rather than a best assessment perspective in the beginning um, means thinking more about, uh, or, or not thinking necessarily about population dynamics and Bayesian statistics, which we all like to think about more. But as Ray Hilborn mentioned way back, I don't know when, uh, that fisheries management is really about managing people. And so that, you know, when you're talking strategically, people are a big part of the strategy. And then just like a, a graduate degree, my advice to graduate students, don't take too long, right? Think of the 80-20 rule, get it done. Get done for the most part as quickly as you can because you can lose momentum and urgency. And uh, finally, provide evidence for why MSC is a benefit to fisheries. Um, it, it's not enough to just say, you know, oh, we're gonna meet objectives. Uh, it'd be good to demonstrate why the MSC is better than what is currently being done and just let people make the choice in that case. Uh, I haven't come across a situation where an adopted MP was, was abandoned in favor of some other approach once they've been once they've been used and people have gotten used to it. So I think that's that's the the getting through some of these hurdles, you know, I think we do that. Eventually we can get into into the things we really want to do. You know, we can get into more research, we can get into new types of data collection because we have time. You know, a turn the crank management procedure doesn't require a lot of effort except every few years to kind of retune it. But in the meantime, we can do things like, you know, develop camera systems like we've been doing or eventually get into close kin market capture, which, uh, which I think is going to be a big thing for fisheries coming up. So thank you very much. And I'll take any, any questions. I need to have time. I think we're on time. Yep, we have about 10 minutes for questions. Thanks very much, Sean, for a really fascinating talk.
I got a couple, um, or at least one. Uh, you pointed out that there's, uh, like, say, increasing tendency to, let's say, take on a precautionary approach. And uh, when you do MSC modeling, uh, it's common to develop a number of models. I was surprised at how many models, operating models, could be developed in those tuna fisheries. That's that's really insane. Um, but that kind of leads to the question of um, how do you actually vet, like what are some, what's best practice in terms of vetting the number of operating models and the ones that get, uh, let's say proposed. Uh, uh, there's a lot of different operating models proposed for different reasons. You, you tied that to the number of researchers. It doesn't necessarily always happen that way. But uh, um, so in your experience, like especially this concern about precautionary operating models, like that was a problem with in the IWC, uh, you know, different groups coming in with models that reflected their political views on what should be done. Yeah. So in MSC context, how do you actually, what are some uh, best practice rules for vetting those operating models that get proposed? Well, again, I, I think this comes down to, to the people issue, right? Because you, you do have politics. I don't, I don't claim to know what the best practice would be for that because the only place I've seen it dealt with effectively is the CCSBT. Um, in that case, they don't have a whole, they don't have a lot of uh, axes of uncertainty. They, I forget how many there are. There's, there's only about, I'd say maybe four main uh, features, but then each one of those has a certain number of levels. Uh, but there's pretty standard ones, you know, there's, you know, there's, um, you know, stock recruitment steepness, of course, which is part of every single one. Um, what they do in that case is they uh, they agree on a weighting of each level within each of those axes, and then simply and they have over four hundred because they they then just sample various combinations. Um, so that's. And, and that's a that's a multi-country, you know, fairly big body that remarkably functions pretty well, um, possibly because, you know, the people who are involved, you know, the Australians and New Zealand, I mean, they're very, very good at um, at fisheries decision making. You know, they just tend to be good at it. Uh, other places are more difficult. Like what what we're you know, dealing with with Atlantic bluefin tuna, it's a really difficult situation trying to uh, prioritize and, and rank operating models. But let me add, let me add a little bit here, Sean. The, the really important thing here is something you brought up very early, and that is to be honest and self-critical about the models. To sit there and look at what you have when you have a proposed operating model and say, what could we have really screwed up here? what what could really be going wrong like natural mortality rate changes associated with changes in marine, marine mammal predation which we think may be a critical part of the herring story but one of the problems is that you get the statistical approach becoming a way of defending a model rather than being scientifically honest about yeah. the uncertainty and you said that and I, I think that really bears repeating it isn't how many models you elaborate, it's, it's how good you are at figuring out what might, how you might get blindsided that matters. You know, I, I've been, um, I've been reading this book called The Science of Conjecture. I don't know if you ever heard of that book, but it's um, it basically it goes back and it's really a book about probability and what it means, what probability means. And if you go back to the origins of probability, we're really in law, which is a quality, obviously a qualitative subject and, you know, trying to establish plausibility. And, you know, way back, you know, a couple hundred years, they've, <laughs> it's I, like, I'm reading it thinking, oh my God, we just talked about that last week in, in this meeting, you know, we, we are still dealing with this problem and that's, I think what Carl's saying is what it is. We have to say, okay, what do we think? You know, regardless of what the AIC value is, 
you know, do we think marine mammals are a main feature driving herring mortality? And if they are, is our current approach management procedure robust to that? Yeah, I think the issue of uh, being robust to things that really matter in your judgment is important. Robin has a question. Robin Forrest. Hey, Robin. Hi, Sean. Thanks very much for that talk. That was great to see everything put together like that. Um, just to comment on that Hake uh, graph that you put up showing what the actual decisions had been. I remember seeing that graph for the first time when I was involved with Hake and uh, wondering um, why we had an MSC at all, that you know the fleet had a certain capacity to adopt a certain TSE and that was uh, the decision that got made every year. And I wondered after seeing that, uh, whether we'd had a, a lapse of decision context or not. Um, my question though, uh, is about- well, yeah, uh, I wanna comment on that too, but you go ahead. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> go, go ahead, Sean. Well, you know, I, for a few years there when I was on the, on the joint technical committee, you know, we would sit there agonizingly through these, you know, scientific review meetings for a week every February and just agonize over details and details and details and then turn around and, and we plotted that out and it was like, why are we even doing any science? Yeah. <laughs> that, and that's what you're saying. I totally agree. And yeah. I, I, I was saying that to like Ian and, and them and they're like, no, don't, 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 don't bring that up. It was like, you know, shut the academic up basically, you know, in a nice way. Sorry, your question. Yeah. Um, it's really about, I guess, communication, uh, reference point stock status. This is something that we're running into a lot at the moment. Uh, as you know, the Fisheries Act uh, has recently undergone a lot of changes. And now for many stocks, we're required to develop a limit reference point and report on stock status. And when you take an MSC approach, especially for data limited species, um, it's not possible to say what the stock status is. Rather, you're, you are able to say this, your focus becomes on the objectives and the performance rather than on the uh, model outcomes. And so your, your advice shifts from this is the stock status to, um, to this management procedure or this set of management procedures have a 95% probability of meeting the objectives, for example. Um, and that's a very subtle difference in how we provide advice. And it's been, being very difficult to communicate that that should be an accepted form of advice. And even when we do present yeah. uh, MSE type results, for example, for outside yellow and inside yellow eye rockfish, we still have managers asking, well, can't we just average the reference points from all the operating models, you know, because they really want to cling on to that stock status. So I just wondered if you had any thoughts or advice on that. Well, to, to me, uh, I mean, the, the, the real issue is, a, is just getting a repeatable management procedure in place and used. And then I, I tend to downplay reference points. You know, I think if you have, you know, a, a management procedure that you're comfortable with, that just pick something, you know, and, and we've done that. We do that for Sablefish. We, we average, we, even for Yellow Eye, I think we averaged all the operating models and presented one uh, set of outputs that was the, the weighted average across all the operating models. Um, I, I think DFO, DFO in Ottawa is, is just, they're out of sync with what is really going on. And, and you know when when we were doing started out with sablefish like that was right when the DFO you know precautionary harvest policy was created and the moment we started thinking about that and how to implement it we ran into all kinds of problems like okay so is this is this you know we called it the Neapolitan plot right the the different strawberry banana and chocolate ice cream plot and you know, are these reference points or is it a harvest control rule? Because those are different. And so then as you know, we, we ended up having to write a paper on that, which we clearly demonstrated they are different and that didn't get accepted either. Like nothing seems to change in the DFO policy. And we've talked to the people who have who've done it about the, the problems with it and the, the problems it's creating. Like it's, it's really almost an impediment 
to, and it's a very simple one to get around, I think, to implementing this kind of approach. So we, we keep, you know, what I tend to do is just, I don't know, for, for sable fish, maybe we've got a, a bit more, I, I don't know, the, certainly in a context like herring, it's quite challenging, right? Because then you've got, you've got governance issues and then um, lots of policy things going on. So it's a bit more complicated, but for some of the single species fisheries issues, I, I think um, my advice, when we did this for prawn just, just two days ago, just pick one and we'll avoid it. Yeah, thanks, John. Yeah, I think the problem we're running into now is that for some stocks, we're going to have a legal requirement to um, state what the LRP and the stock status are. Sure, and, sure. and we, and we have, I mean, Sablefish has one. To communicate that. Mm -hmm. Sablefish has one and same thing. I mean, you can, you can pick them. But yeah, I, I certainly don't have, you know, I don't have the answer, but it's definitely something maybe we can, we should continue to work on mm -hmm. ways of Thanks. doing that. Could I add something there? Well, Robin just said that uh, there may be a legal requirement to provide these LRPs and so on. That's pretty typical of uh, Ottawa. Basically, the call it the, call it the Ottawa problem if you want or something. But you talked about this business of uh, industry and so on being scared away from situations like the Bowie Seamount when the government hauled off and just did something off the wall. And well, what I'm finding more and more recently is industry people coming and asking for help when the governance system does something that's just off the wall destructive. So what I'm seeing is a lot more support from industry for, uh, for objective, just objective analysis and trying to get rid of crazy extreme decisions that are, that are being made like that, mm -hmm. like requiring an LRP that you can't provide when you can manage perfectly safely without it. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think there's going to be a lot more support for the kind of stuff you're doing coming from the uh, people who are being impacted by arbitrary decision making. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I agree to some degree, but um, I, I don't think it's necessarily arbitrary. I think it's just not what we're used to in fisheries. I think I think we're no. We're I, what I mean by arbitrary is when they do something like just close the whole seam out because somebody either does a no calculation or a back of the envelope calculation. Yeah. Or I mean, that, shuts down the shrimp fishery based on a completely arbitrary bycatch limit that has nothing to do with what the bycatch species can sustain. Mm -hmm. That kind of crap. Yeah, and I think those separate into like some of them are like underlying uh, issues of governance and priority and things like that that are not really fisheries issues, but then unfortunately using the data, the science to justify something else like that, that to me is, is something we don't need. If there's a governance issue, if there's a certain priority that somebody wants, then, then to me, you know, according to what I'm saying here, right, is to state it upfront. Let's not waste time doing a whole bunch of work that's not even gonna be considered in the decision. Um, similar, like for for troll fisheries for Chinook that we're we're, you know, we're working with troll fishery in Area F, for example, and you know I, I'm trying to be clear with them, like you are not priority number one. It's, you know, policy wise, you're third on the list, and uh, nevertheless, I mean, it's they still need you know some objective work could show that, yeah, even though we're third on the list, we could still get some fish. But you need that, that analysis to be done. Mike Meldes has a question. Mike? All right, thanks for your talk, Sean. Um, right, I'm wondering about in these various MSE meetings, how often the industry stakeholders might be present from fisheries other than the immediate one in question. So thinking about your Hake example that you showed, 
if the decision to fish less than what could be caught sustainably leads to a higher hake abundance and if hake eats salmon and if that decision therefore might have implications for coastal salmon fisheries would there be representatives from the coastal salmon fisheries in the room for these MSE meetings for Hake, just as an example? Uh, it's, I don't know. Um, I certainly, like in the, in the US for sure, most assessments need to have a, an explicit section in the assessment for ecosystem considerations. So in, in those cases, the, the answer would be yes, but trans, Hake is transboundary and they don't fall within that, that US, um, you know, current US approach. They're, they're a bit more flexible in what they do. I'm trying to think of a situation where that applies. Um, I, I, I would have to stretch it. I mean, I, I can imagine, in any Chinook salmon meetings right now, there are going to be Southern resident and killer whale representatives there, almost for sure, right? So that would be the one I could think of. Um, there's, there's, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure how much, you know, they contribute to it. Okay, thanks. Time for one more question. Oliver Murray, a PhD student has a question. Hey, Sean, thanks for the great talk. Thanks, Oliver. Um, yeah, just a quick question. So referring back to uh, what you referred to as a failed MSC, I'm just wondering, was the request for the MSC initiated by industry in consultation with the government with a clear commitment from government to review and consider the results in their decision-making process? Or was this just something that industry took on on their own with the hopes that the government would be open to the results? Uh, I would say it's, it's exactly in between those two that you mentioned because we, we did have several, like we were talking to uh, DFO Oceans uh, and that, I think that was one of the main challenges we had was that oceans, you know, DFO is fisheries and then there's oceans and the oceans section really doesn't know what's going on in terms of fisheries, right? They don't know about MSC, they don't know why it's there or anything like that. And they, they're in, you know, one of their main mandates is to create protected areas. And the industry was like, fine we we are totally willing to put in protected areas like that's not the issue the question was let's just do it in a scientific way uh, so we can have that you know nice little trade-off that, that you know that kind of win-win situation where we protect the corals and we still get a small fishery so but I, I think you're right I, I think and that was kind of what I was saying earlier is that we never actually got that very clear okay this is how you know you're going to take this MSC approach and you're going to evaluate these options, which which we did. You know, we we got options from the management board. You know, we had we had a list of four possible types of management procedures to look at, and you know, we were, we were simulating those and and that, but I think at a, at a you know stepping back up a, up a higher level, it was never clear exactly what the goal was from the management side so if i could just have a follow-up on that mm -hmm. um given there was you mentioned sort of follow with the uh, reputation of mses um what advice would you give fishery scientists when let's when they're approached by industry and yeah. find themselves in a similar situation what advice would i give in the situation is to be honest up front that this might not turn out the way you think and in fact, I, I do this, um, I do this with a little, maybe I are not mentioning you take a, you guys have a decision course. So you know, you know what a decision tree is, right? You, you have a little box and you, you can t take decision A or B where B is like, just keep doing what you're doing. And then you have some 
uncertain outcomes, you take action A, which is to do like an MST or collect bottom contact information, which is the real issue here. Uh, there's an uncertain outcome there, right? It may be used to your benefit. It may also not be used to your benefit. And so that's my advice is to be honest up front in with the industry as to what might happen here. And, and then try to assign probabilities to those outcomes. Like it's a, it, you know, it's like, it's like going to court, you know, do you, do, when you go to court, do you, what's your probability of winning going to court versus settling, you know, that you should always have that alternative there. That doesn't mean, you know, to do an MSE or not. I, I think, although even there, like some, I, I can think of some situations where fisheries have not, they've not jumped on board on the MSE approach for one of the reasons being they, they tend, they see it as losing control over their uh, quotas, over their, you know, over their fishery to some kind of automatic procedure, which, so yeah, my advice is, is be honest and try to not just tell people, but try to make sure they understand what it is they're getting into. Because these things can, can cost a lot of money like that, that, you know, SKB process, you know, creating the cameras and like that, that costs a few hundred thousand dollars in, uh, in effort for sure. So just being honest. So great. Thanks so much, Sean, for uh, giving a talk, giving someone our uh, super interesting, really great uh, discussion afterwards.